I'm delighted to be here to talk to you about the possible applications of quantum computing. Personally, when I was an undergrad, I couldn't decide to study computer science or physics. So this topic, which is a combination of the two, is really, really fascinating to me. Thinking about the limitations of our current classical computers and the potential possibilities of our future quantum ones. Today, I'll start by giving a brief introduction and motivation to quantum computing before describing the quantum computing program at IBM. And at the end, I'll give you a little glimpse of a couple of possible applications we've been exploring with some collaborators in the finance industry. Pursued for decades in research labs, prototype quantum computers are rapidly emerging, with the prototypes getting larger and more capable but the technology is generally not understood. We need to educate the quantum workforce of the future, as well as more quantum researchers and engineers to build and understand the hardware. We'll need even more quantum developers to write the software and applications that will run on them, and quantum trained practitioners to be able to effectively and efficiently use the machines. And that is one reason, two years ago, we created the IBM Q experience. We wanted to take quantum computers out of the lab and into the world to people like yourselves. The IBM Q experience was the first quant public quantum computer and developer ecosystem. Anybody in the world can freely go online and access our 16 and five qubit devices and program fairly simple circuits on them using a drag and drop composer interface. Over here on your right, I have a bit of a schematic of what it looks like between the user's laptop and our quantum device. So we have the user's laptop, which could, is connected through the cloud to a classical, quantum a classical computing stack, which is then connected to our quantum chip which sits at the bottom of a very, very special refrigerator. This refrigerator keeps our quantum chip at negative 270 degrees, no, 273 degrees Kelvin, colder than outer space, almost absolute zero. The conditions that are needed to be able to create these quantum bits and manipulate them to do our calculations. So here we have a very short animation showing a very simple circuit going from that user's laptop through the cloud to that classical computing stack that takes that very simple circuit, turns into a set of microwave pulses, takes those pulses to the quantum chip, which does the calculations, creates a couple of microwave pulses as output, which are then returned back to the classical computing stack and then sent all the way back to the cloud to the user's laptop. Building on the success of our IBM Q experience and Kiskit, last year we launched the IBM Q network. Realizing that we couldn't do this alone, the IBM Q network is a collaboration of Fortune 500 companies, national research labs, and research institutions. We're combining all of our expertise together to advance quantum computing, expand the ecosystem, and find the first practical applications of quantum computing for business and science. So when people start to collaborate with us, we take them through a training course. We teach them about quantum computing. We talk about our software stack. And then we think about what type of use cases and applications they can use quantum computing for in their industry. They can first test these out on our simulators and then run them on our commercial quantum computing devices. Currently, they have access to a 20 qubit device and we'll be upgrading them to a 50 qubit device in the future. 50 qubits is a very interesting crossover point in quantum computing hardware because it is at the crossover point of what we can simulate fully without making any assumptions on our classical computers today. And so we believe that sort of 50 to hundreds of qubits is where we'll be able to achieve quantum advantage. Quantum advantage being when a quantum computer 
will be able to solve a problem of interest to society faster than a classical computer. So currently, we have small, noisy quantum computers, and we believe that it will be useful to exp I mean, we'll be able to use these for useful problems in business and science. What type of applications could these be? So harking back to my caffeine molecule earlier, we believe that quantum chemistry is going to be one of the early applications of quantum computer, simulating quantum chemistry. Imagine if we could truly simulate the behavior of atoms and molecules, their energies and interactions. We might be able to discover new life-saving drugs in a fraction of the time it takes today. We could research and develop new, lighter, more efficient materials to improve the world around us. Another approach to financial problems is to look for patterns in past data using machine learning techniques. And machine learning techniques have been used very successfully in areas such as trading, economic forecasting, underwriting, credit scoring, to name a few. However, sometimes the computational costs of such techniques can be prohibitive. Now, quantum machine learning is a very early and new area of research. And it's early days yet, but we hope that one day it may provide the tools to satisfy our growing data volume, variety, and complexity. An example of a machine learning problem is a classification one. So let's say we have two groups of customers. We have our red uh, credit risky customers and our yellow credit worthy customers. And what we want to do is separate those two customers out into two groups. The way we do this sometimes in a classical computer is we try to find the customers at the boundaries of those groups so we can find a dividing line between them. So if we get a new customer, we know on what side of that dividing line they are on, if they are credit worthy or credit risky. And we want to find the largest separation between those two groups as possible because we don't want any false negatives or false positives. We don't want to accidentally give that home loan to that credit risky customer. However, how you look at the data can depend on whether you can find that separating line between groups of customers, between groups of data. So here, looking at this one-dimensional line, you can see that there is no way to draw a straight line between our red dots and our yellow dots, our credit risky and our credit worthy customers. However, if we look at the data in two dimensions, you can see now that it is possible to separate out those two groups and define that dividing line. Much of what we do in machine learning is looking at data in different ways to try to find that classification, to try to group them, to find members like them. Using, uh, using quantum computing, we're able to access different uh, dimensions of data that you can't in classical computing. We're trying to find a higher dimensional space that isn't available classically using those quantum mechanical uh, properties such as superposition and entanglement. So I hope I have conveyed to you all that quantum computing is real and its impact to our world is eminent. We at IBM and other companies as well are building quantum computers today and people are using them through the IBM Q network and the IBM Q experience. Now is the time to begin exploring what you and your companies can do with quantum computers. Think about it this way. If we were back in the 1950s and you all had had five to 10 years to prepare for the advent of the mainframe while it was still a prototype, you had five to 10 years to prepare to try to be and get that competitive edge over others. In hindsight, jumping in early would have been the right thing to do. That is where we are with quantum computing today.